are these people? Um, since we're barreling towards a full-scale war with Iran that we're going to be a part of, I figured we should do some foreshadowing, Colin, of what that might look like. And luckily, Mint Press News' Robert Inlikesh is going to help us out with that, about what that battlefield could actually look like, right? So if people weren't paying attention, we're going to do some looky-loos. All right. So while U.S. Congress showed strong support for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's statements on Iran in July, the media has largely shied away from coverage of what potential American involvement in Israeli-Iranian conflict could look like. As a result, the public remains largely unaware of the potential consequences and the specific role the U.S. might play in such a scenario. In 2002, okay, 2002, the U.S. military conducted the Millennium Challenge Simulation. Do you remember this, Gabriel? Costing approximately two hundred and fifty no. million dollars, million taxpayer dollars. These exercises reveal that the American military would likely face failure in an all-out war with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Okay, would you like to see that? You like to look at that? Let's go look at that. So this is from the National Interest, right? This is by Maya Carlin. We'll get to her in a second. Right. So how the U.S. military lost a war to Iran in a simulation. OK. In 2002, the Pentagon convened a fictitious war game to test a future enemy equipped with advanced technology and tactics. Dubbed the Millennium Challenge, the congressionally mandated exercises pitted the blue U.S. team up against the red Iran-like Middle Eastern team. Set in a time frame five years in the future. So 2006, right? Uh, okay. 2007. Right. Math. Number, Wang. Mm -hmm. The warfare practice involved both live exercises and computer simulations, which cost approximately $250 million. The game well, grew to. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> essentially, for some more games. Right. <laughs> Um, I, someone look up for me what it costs to make the movie War Games. I would like to see if that's less than two hundred fifty million. Um. Anyway, the games grew to encompass thirteen thousand five hundred service members participating from seventeen different simulation locations across several training sites. Within a matter of days, the red team. That's the Iranian team sucked 19 blue team ships and rendered its carrier battle group ineffective. While the rules of the game remain controversial, its outcome emphasized the detriment of group thinking and the power of innovative asymmetric warfare. So guess what, Colin? After the U.S.'s well, team's quick and miserable defeat, additional constraints were placed on the red team. The control group of the games instructed Van Riper that his team could not shoot down the airframes flying cover for their enemy's ground forces. The red team was also prohibited from hiding their offensive weapons or from using chemical warfare against the blue team's paratroopers. Okay, so they... they yeah, yeah, they handicapped them, <laughs> essentially. So, with these extreme disadvantages in place, the blue team ultimately succeeded in their mission to destroy Iran's military capabilities after handicapping them. Right? right. So the blue team's inability to use flexibility and quick thinking in its response to the Reds' initial attack reflected a rigidity that would not serve the U.S. well in real conflict. The costliest war game in American history did not play out exactly how the Pentagon had hoped. While obtaining advanced technology and sophisticated weaponry is a crucial component in war, it won't necessarily guarantee a win. Innovative warfare combined with adaptability can be just as lethal. How many times, Care Bear, have I talked about efficiency? If you can do war cheaper, better. Right. Right? Or, well, anything. Well, yes. I don't want to say anything. But uh, yes, there's some like outlet but with this specifically right if it does the same job for cheaper gooder better better gooder right so 
the the article the, <laughs> the writer of that article is an analyst with the Center for Security Policy and a former Anna Sobolevi fellow at IDZ Hazelia in Israel. She has bylines in many publications, including the National Interest, Jerusalem Post, and Times of Israel. So that's Israelis worried about it. Right. Just just a little to give some, you know, context there. But back to in Lakesh, since then, remember that was in 2002. Right? Predicting what would happen five years after that in 2007. Right. It's now 2024. Iran probably got better, no? You'd think? Since then, Iran has significantly advanced its missile technology, drones, air defense systems, and even naval capabilities, further complicating any potential conflict scenario. Right? So, let's see how that war game plays out there, boys. You know? Um, Washington has repeatedly stated that that it does not seek war with Iran, with President Joe Biden publicly making it clear to Israel that he will not order direct U.S. participation in any Israeli attack on Iranian territory. Uh Uh-huh. Motherfucker lies through his teeth, don't he? While Israel is often touted as having the most powerful military in West Asia with 169,500 active duty personnel across its Army, Navy, and Air Force, along with 465,000 reservists, Its forces are stretched thin. They are heavily deployed across the northern front with Lebanon, as well as the West Bank and Gaza. Moreover, Israel's military size is significantly outmatched by that of its adversaries in the Republic of Iran. Right? Iran's standing army is reportedly reported to include approximately 610,000 active duty members with an additional 350,000 reserve. Additionally, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, a key component of Iran's military structure, is estimated to have 150,000 to 190,000 members, although these figures remain unverified. Beyond these forces, Iran's potential manpower extends further. It excludes a national police force and the besiege of volunteer social and paramilitary groups said to have millions of members which provides significant mobilization capacity in times of conflict. Uh, The numbers starting to not look great for for us in this regard. Um, So, yeah, so here's their their missile program, right? You know, their newfangled missile systems and whatnot. I don't know how many those are, but enough. Um, you know, I, it's also just very propaganda like a lot of the videos that I'm going to be playing in a bit, you know, but like, does that not look like a modern army to you? Yeah. That's what it looks like to me. Like, I think people for people think I ran and they think, you know, people throwing rocks, yes. you know? Right. Like, no, homie, it's not just RPGs anymore. Like, it's a lot more than that. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, uh, I say this about Russia and China, too. Like, it's not the 70s anymore, you know? So, again, Iran's military capabilities have advanced significantly, particularly in its missile program. Right. Starting in 2015, Iran began conducting major tests on precision guided long range ballistic missiles. Since then, it has developed increasingly sophisticated missile technology. As a result, Iran now possesses the largest and most advanced missile arsenal in the Middle East, a program that began in response to the challenges faced during the Iran Iraq war. In addition to its missile force, Iran has made significant strides in drone and cruise missile technology. Its advancements in drone technology in particular have garnered international attention, including from Russia during its conflict in Ukraine. Right? So this is, we're talking about those supersonics, all that fun stuff. So in an interview with Mint Press, Beirut-based journalist and columnist for The Cradle, 
Sharmin Narwani, asserted that Iran could defeat Israel in a direct conflict. Israel is 90 times smaller than Iran, a tiny geography with very vulnerable key infrastructure targets, Narwani explained. The argument can be made that with just a few hundred targeted missiles, Iran could destroy Israel's six power plants, two oil fields, two refineries, one oil terminal, three gas fields, five desalination plants, and its remaining ports and partridges and pear trees. The state of Israel would essentially be besieged and lose any self-sufficiencies overnight. That's, that's pretty fast. So Narwani also noted Israel's military vulnerability. All Israeli air bases and airstrips are identified and potential targets too. One key for Iran would be to stop the daily arrival of U.S. weapons by air, which is Tel Aviv's only lifeline for its continuous bombing of Gaza, Lebanon, and Syria. Remember the only thing in that war games thing, that handicap they gave them? You couldn't take down blue team's air defenses? Right. That's, that's this. That's, yeah, that's you. <laughs> so, well, you know, but that's specifically the one thing they don't want Iran to do, pretty much, is like deal with our air superiority, pretty much. Right. So don't take down our planes. Which, like, the red team's like, no, why wouldn't we do that? That's the smart move to do. So, um, it's also, their military forces are nothing to joke at either. I mean, they are same, same as far as commandos and whatever are concerned to me. Uh, there's practically no difference between them and, and SEAL teams, American military force. You know, other than this kind of stuff, which as a martial artist, cr I cringe at. But, you know, all this is standard training stuff. They can repel just like Marines can in modern gear. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, you know, they're out there doing battle ropes, hitting people with sticks. You know, they're doing all the propaganda fun stuff. Um... But yeah, I love how people will be like, do propaganda video. Have you seen a Marine recruitment ad ever? You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, same, same, dog. You know? So, if the United States were to become involved in direct attacks on Iranian soil as a result of Israeli aggressions, threats have already been issued against U.S. bases across the region. As of mid-August, an estimated 40,000 U.S. soldiers were stationed throughout the Middle East deployed at military bases in Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and the Arab Gulf states. Iran's missile capabilities recently demonstrated during its retaliatory strikes on Israel in operation known as Operation True Promise 2. Electric Boogaloo have shown their precision in targeting some of the most heavily guarded military bases in the world. These missiles are capable of striking at much longer distances than the U.S. bases located near Tehran's immediate vicinity. So you remember this? Um, yes. This was this was them, you know, hitting Tel Aviv, right? You know, throwing yep. a ton of dud missiles at the Iron Dome, so that their one or two actually targeted ones made it through, right? So, you know, the community notes here are saying, "Did that Tel Aviv? That's Negev." Uh huh. Same difference, though, huh? Like, anyway, um, beyond Iran's military capabilities, the Islamic Republic also has allies throughout the region. Operating in Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine, according to Sharmin Narwani, the Islamic resistance in Iraq may still have a significant role to play. The Iraqi resistance has shown that it can participate in a multi-front war against Israel and its U.S. partner, especially now that Lebanon is a full war front, Narwani said. It has done so by successfully launching drones and missiles of higher sophistication and, with more frequency, hitting Israeli targets. Should the regional war escalate and direct U.S. military engagement in support of Israel occur, the Iraqi resistance will likely turn its focus to more accessible targets within Iraq's neighboring borders. In Yemen, the Ansrallah-led government in Sunnah has demonstrated its capability over the past 10 months 
to overcome the efforts of a U.S.-led multinational naval coalition aimed at breaking the blockade imposed on Israel in the Red Sea. In December 2023, the U.S. launched Operation Prosperity Guardian, designed to ensure the safe passage of ships to the Israeli-controlled port of Eliot. Eliot. Um, despite these costly efforts, the U.S. and its allies have failed to break the blockade. As a result, the port of Eliot was eventually forced to file for bankruptcy. Covered that. Yemen's ability to reach Tel Aviv with both drones and missiles, along with its continued resistance, signals that Ansharallah could pose a legitimate threat to U.S. forces in the Arabian Peninsula. Moreover, if Iran were to close the Strait of Hormuz, it would likely succeed, triggering a global oil crisis. In Iraq, the Hasht al shabi or Popular Mobilization Forces, are another key Iranian ally with an estimated force of around 238,000 men. Hezbollah in Lebanon also commands over 100,000 active duty fighters. Additionally, the presence of Palestinian, Syrian, Iraqi, Afghani, Pakistani, and other militia forces operating inside Syria adds yet another unpredictable factor to the regional landscape. The capabilities of the various militia groups, political parties, and standing armies at Iran's disposal across the region remain largely unknown. However, what is known is that many of these groups are battle-hardened from years of grueling ground battles with everyone from ISIS to the IDF, and that they possess diverse arsenals of rockets, missiles, and drones. Speaking to Mint Press News, Sharmin Narwani explained, based on what we know about Iran's advanced missile arsenal, Tehran could easily target all U.S. naval bases and assets in the Persian Gulf, as well as those in Iraq and Syria, as we witnessed in 2020. Darwani further highlighted that the U.S. has never been able to beat Iran in simulated regular warfare gaming exercises unless the Americans cheated, which we just saw how they did, or rigged these games. This is one reason the Pentagon consistently avoids direct military conflict with Iran. The U.S. risks losing billions in foreign military assets. So, Narwani also pointed out that potential U.S. strikes on Iran could be costly. If the targets are Iran's key operational infrastructure, this would be a significant loss for Iran, but also a difficult task for the Americans due to Iran's immense geographical size and varied terrain. On the other hand, she noted the targeting of U.S. military bases, facilities, and naval ships is much easier for the Iranians as these are mostly stationary or easily spotted targets, which could eradicate U.S. military presence in the region. Should the U.S. decide to engage in direct war with Iran, the threats to its forces throughout their region would be formidable. While such a war would undoubtedly be costly for all sides, it is clear that it would not be a simple endeavor. Some neoconservatives in the U.S. have framed a war on Tehran as similar to the 2003 Iraq War, However, Iran is largely mountainous country, approximately three times the size of Iraq in both population and land mass, making a potential conflict there far more complex. And we know both Kamala and Trump have both pushed this. Right? Right. So, and their buddies behind Kamala, as in Dick Cheney, Karl Rove, and 500 other Republicans um, that back her, are more than okay with this. They were okay with it when Bush did it, when Daddy Bush tried to do it, when, you know, like, they're okay with Trump doing it for sure. So, <laughs> they don't care. Um, so, any thoughts before I, before I move on? I mean, it just, it just makes it kind of strange. Well, it doesn't make it strange, but it's like, you're willing to take out I'm saying regarding to the U.S. You're willing to take out what? I mean, I mean, are people, you know, essentially in yeah. order to gain resources that you possibly may not get because Iran is just that powerful. So it, it it's kind of like the greed, you know, like, and almost, and also kind of like the arrogance of the West in mm -hmm. terms of thinking, 
Yeah, well, yeah, they might beat us, but who gives a fuck? We're going to give it our college one, too. And, you know, because given the simulations, unless, like, you know, they severely handicap them, as you said, yeah, they're not going to win. So it's like, why even try? Right. You know, like, it, it's almost like, you know, a girl's under part, undercarriage is that good, you know, like, even though that you cannot possibly get her, like, but you're willing to do anything in the hope that you won't get her, you know? So it, that's kind of what it reminds me of. And it's just kind of like, we're willing to send our family, our family members for this bullshit. Yeah. Yep. And I think the minute that any American boots start getting involved is the only the time the American public will decide, hey, look at that donation from the Accord Lord. Appreciate you, fam. Um, Thank you. Yes, sir. For the boys, he says. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely don't think this will go the way they think it will. And I think if, you know, as angry as we've been seeing Palestine... I think the entire okay. Islamic, you know, like region is probably feeling very similar things. And it makes your trigger right. finger pretty itchy seeing some of that. So, you know, I, I'm sure people are willing to, people have been willing to go to bat for this. So I brought, I brought this poem. Um, it was, I found it in another article from Vijay Prashad. Um, so... He's pulling Edel Adnan, a Lebanese poet and artist who grew up in Beirut after her parents fled the collapsing Ottoman Empire that became modern-day Turkey. He dug deep into the soil of conflict and pain. The ingredients for her poetry, her voice resonated from the balcony of apartment in Ashrafia, the little mountain, from where she could see the ships come in and out of the port. When Edel Adnan died, the novelist Elias Khoury, who himself died, just before Beirut was again bombed, wrote that he mourned a woman who would not die, but he feared for his city, which was suffering alone. Here are a few extracts from Edel's poem, Beirut, 1982, remind us that we are as angry as a storm. I never believed that vengeance would be a tree growing in my garden. Trees grow in all directions, so do Palestinians. Uprooted and unlike butterflies, wingless, earthbound, heavy with love for their borders and their misery. No people can go forever behind bars or under the rain. We shall never cry with tears, but with blood. It is not in the cemeteries that we shall plant grain, nor in the palm of my hand. We are as angry as a storm. Closing thoughts, Care Bear. I mean, yeah, I, I we said this before, but you know, as you said, you know, just wait if American lives die, yeah, and the body count is high, regardless of who it is under, you know, like. I wonder if that's what it's going to take to actually have more people get more livid than they are now. Especially, I, and I don't want to put this hope, you know, but I hope in a way it's under Kamala because I'm just waiting for something for people to actually, and I was saying this to a friend uh, yesterday. Uh, and I think I told you this off camera yesterday, but, um, you know, he's going to vote for Kamala Harris because he believes that Trump is the, the greater evil and the, the, all the things, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and I was like, well, and I didn't want to continue going on with him, but I basically said, look, um, I hope that if Kamala does win, that the energy that you have, that you would have for Trump in terms of everyone being an activist and being out on the streets, as we saw, like, in 2016. I hope you would have that same energy, like, 
well, I, I'll say it this way. He, he was like, you know, we all have agency in our vote, right? So yeah. by default, to all have agency in keeping our politicians accountable of the things that they promise us. So I said to him, ultimately, I hope that if Kamala wins, that you will do your job in keeping her accountable of, well, the thing is she hasn't promised anything because she's vague as hell. But regardless, I said, I hope that you keep her accountable of the things that she allegedly promises us. Um, that's your job. And he agreed. He's not going to do it, though. Because, mm -hmm. you know, he's... No, they like, go back to sleep you know, he, every time. No, but he's... And the thing is, he's a black guy. And mm -hmm. he's... Like, we grew up, and this will relate to my next story. We grew up in the same neighborhood. We went to the same school, but the difference was, for both of us, we got out of our town. You know, we both went to the same um, college. Different years, but we went to Boston College. He's, I, I forgot exactly what he does, but he's in the medical field. So he's good for all intents and purposes. Yeah, you know, he's he going to be all wife, right. He has a house. So he's going to be all right, regardless, even if Trump, he may not like Trump, but he will be fine under Trump. The idea is that, there are people in this world that are not fine regardless of who is present. And people are not concerned about that. People are not thinking about them. It's just the idea, as I said earlier in the last segment, about your comfort or what you're willing to put up with. And Trump, for some reason, is just like the being that get, makes people's skin crawl. And I'm like, well, we have a president and a presidential candidate that right now is complicit in a genocide uh, in a country far away from you, but there are people who are affected by it, who want to stand up to them against it, and yet you're shaming people that even do not want to vote or, God forbid, want to vote for Jill Stein right. or any other alternative party or person, you know? But you're not standing up to the very person that is committing the genocide, but you're worried about what Trump is going to do within the next few months, assuming he's going to be president. Yeah, we know what Trump is going to do. Like, he's made no secret to what he's going to do. The difference is, is that Kamala has sp spoken out both sides of her mouth, basically being like, oh, we'll send aid. Oh, we'll help them. But at the same time, Israel has the right to protect itself, and we will continue to send weapons to blow up the asses so that mm -hmm. they, we can essentially level it a lot slower, you know, but we will feed them. We will give them medicine and all that bullshit before we kill them. At least Trump is honest and saying, I just want to level the shit. Yep. You know, <clears throat> Kamala is like, wants the same thing, but she will pretty it up in terms of humanitarian aid, allegedly. So, which is really worse? Um, yep. Pretending to care or actually saying, speaking with your chest, I don't give a fuck. So, you know, but as I said, if we get involved in Iran and it will become like another Iraq, Afghanistan situation, mm -hmm. People will be pissed, and unfortunately, you know, I'm gonna laugh for their faces. Assuming like, if it's Kamala that's leading the charge, it's like you voted for this shit. It's not yep. like she didn't warn you that she wasn't going to withhold back in terms of what she plans to do regarding Israel's right to defend itself. She basically told you. Walk around and, yet, and find out. So worried about as the kids say, right. Basically. So, we'll see. Well, talking about this kind of stuff is why we're demonetized. So, pull out your phone, get the camera app out, scan that little code right there on your screen, or go to that code-fee.com slash any news network, or go in the description, find one of the ways to donate. We make it super easy. So, appreciate any monetary help you can give. You can't do that. YouTube supposedly tells us that if you hit like and subscribe, that helps. If you share the video, that 
that probably helps too. If you leave a comment, if you click a bell, supposedly all those things make it better for us, but we're not sure. So go, go ahead, do some science, test that on your own, help that number go up, you know, get some more people here. Otherwise, thanks for watching.